Today, on the Woven Energy Podcast. In shamanism, we put ourselves out of, outside of our quote-unquote comfort zone for a purpose. That purpose is to gain feedback from nature, to gain true understanding. It's no longer demon show me how to be a shaman. This is me accepting responsibility for becoming a shaman. If anyone ever gets a chance to be friends with a Mongol, do it. You will learn about animism through making friends with just about any Mongol you meet. The word is grace. That's, that's, but again, you know, the, the level of cultural baggage in our society attached to that word. Your juice is clear. You're like clear water. But the your guide knows that you don't want to be an animist. You're already an animist if your juice is clear, right? He knows that you want to be a shaman. All of the stages of shamanism, uh, they build your guha, yeah? So I would distinguish between the process of becoming a shaman, remember the seven stages, and shamanism itself. The two things are not the same. Hey guys, welcome to the Woven Energy Podcast. I'm here again with Damon Smith to talk about shamanism in all its many shapes and forms, and as always, from the ground up. I cannot believe we're here on episode nine already. We're having so much fun with these podcasts in general, and Damon was telling me the other day that this they're, they're finally a good outlet for him to try and uh, to try and get his colossal amount of experience and knowledge out there to help as many people as possible and show them a side to shamanism, which is very much rooted in reality, if you like. I mean, all he was saying, all Damon really wants to do is help as many people as possible, really understand shamanism so you can all apply it directly to your life and get some of the richness out of life that he's experienced himself. And that, after all, is what shamanism is about, shamanism and animism. It's about applying it and experiencing it. So remember in the last episode when we were talking about the second component of Chilicity, There is a lot of love in Toshalti, and that is why we're all here. We're here to spread that knowledge. So we're going to continue with our mini-series of three episodes here on the topic of uh, where do I begin? Uh, How do I become a shaman, et cetera, et cetera. So if you haven't listened to episode seven or eight yet, then go, go and listen now. This episode fits in with those. Um, This is all to do with the first stage of shamanism. Um, the foundation of shamanism, the the supporting pillar of shamanism, which is developing chilicity. There are three components to chilicity, and we've chatted so far about the first two, which is in, in Mongol is um, bat and toshaltin. So in this episode, we're going to kick off with a bit of a chat about the first two again, and then move on to the third component, which which I found very difficult to pronounce. So how do you say it, Damon? Guchach. Guchach. Okay, cool. So. Um, we were chatting the other day and uh, you happened to mention something which I think is worth mentioning here. Your job keeps you firmly on the road, right? Yeah, it does indeed. I mean, every time I ring you, you seem to be driving somewhere. So uh... <laughs> <laughs> This is true. Give us a rough estimate of how many miles you must have driven in your time. Would you say the equivalent uh, of many, many times around the earth? I, I, I hate to think. Um, <laughs> so, certainly over half a million miles, I, I couldn't say. A, a tremendous amount. And how many times have you been involved in a car crash? Uh, Never. Now, you had a great answer as to why. And uh, you also told me about a few near misses you had. And statistically, that is a huge achievement. So why do you think this is, Damon? Uh, Well, you know, (laughs) I can understand your leading question, Joe, but clearly the answer is chelicity. You know, it's it's not... um, it's not a 100% foolproof thing, you know, that there's a lot of luck involved in things like this. But but Chalisti has saved me from a few falls. Um, one of the things I would say about shamanism, it doesn't stop you tripping up. Um, it, it helps you not to fall down when you do trip up. Mm. It like, as we said one time, I think it's about preparing uh, rather than, rather than um, planning. So you you end up with a reasonable amount of preparation for different situations, um, but but it's not you know I wouldn't like to give the impression that there's like some magic or something going on. There's absolutely not. One occasion um, when I was when I was driving, I can't remember how long ago years ago, um, I came out the back of a traffic queue, and for whatever reason, I noticed um, that the driver coming up behind me hadn't. Um, hadn't noticed the traffic queue. And so I had, I guess, I, I don't know whether I noticed that any earlier than anybody else would, but 
but I had enough time to pull off onto the hard shoulder. Um, and the driver hit the car in front that was in front of me in the queue. So, you know, I, I, it's impossible to say, you know, that there's nothing miraculous about Chalisti, but I feel that it, it saved my neck a few times yeah. um, in my life. Uh, not the least of which, remember, we were talking about the wild run or the wild hunt, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a, that's, but that's, that's a deliberate thing, you know, yeah. that's a deliberate thing. Do, do I walk around in, in my life high or drive around in my life highly aware of everything that's going on around me? Uh, no, I don't. But these, these things are a matter of degree, aren't they? So yeah. I, I wouldn't say that it's like, you know, some kind of superpower or anything like that, but it, it certainly has mitigated a few problems for me over the years. Well, you reference back to uh, uh, something from Bat, and uh, to be honest, uh, I'm going to be completely honest, I, I just cannot, re- it's one of those things, no matter how many times I say it to myself, I can't remember it, but it's like the Eyes of the Eagle, something like that. Burag uh, Shikhat Harate. Borak Sheik Hat Harate. Borak Sheik Hat Harate. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah we got to get you learn a Mongol joke. I know. <laughs> That's a, Amongst yeah, all the other things. We got to get me learn a Mongol. Um, <laughs> it's a, that is not an easy language to pronounce, but, yeah. but it's worth the effort because the difference between, if I, if I compare, for instance, Mongol with Chinese, which I know even less about, to be honest, mm. um, it, which is shameful, really. You know, the the amount of time I've spent with uh, native Chinese teachers, for instance, um, my my Mandarin is, is shameful. Um, <laughs> but if if I compare the two, they, they both are better languages for talking about shamanism than, than English. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but... I would say Mongol is far better than Chinese, and I guess that's obvious why. Uh, Mongols have always been shamanistic to a, a greater or lesser extent, even during the era um, when they were they were the relatively short era when they were communist. Mm. Um, they they preserved their shamanism fairly well, and certainly their animism fairly well. Uh, Mongols are are very laid back people, um, and I think that really saved them from the kind of the kind of unpleasantness that that happened to old traditions in other countries, um, not just under communism, but under uh, various um, various political regimes. Mm. Um, they are they are lovely, lovely people, um, and so if if anyone ever gets chance to be friends with a Mongol, do it. Uh, that you will learn a lot about, so not necessarily about shamanism. Most Mongols know nothing whatsoever about shamanism, but you will learn about animism through making friends with just about any Mongol you meet. Cool. Cool. Well, I brought up um, Borat Hat H. Borat Sheik Hat Hat. Yeah, I brought that up because the example of the car and just moving, it's like um, it kind of. It, is it? It's something. To, it's, it's more to do with bat as well, isn't it? It's that kind of references bat a little bit. Uh, it's uh, chalicity as a whole, obviously, but you know the, the yeah, whole. Yeah, bat is is hanging on to the environment. Bat yeah. bat is is hanging into the. Or, you can think of it as hanging on to it actively, or you can think of it as making sure that you're part of that weave. You know what we talked about. I guess this is why we picked this name, Woven Energy. Yeah. Apart from the obvious fact that the domain name was available, but <laughs> apart from that fact, the 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 weave of of energy within nature is continuous and contiguous uh because of our miasma yeah. we we tend not to recognize that very strongly even though it's true so in some ways bat is simply the recognition of that and trying trying to be part of the big picture um to be part of that weave you know to be part of the the tapestry not something separate from it or stuck on it with glue or something like that yeah. the threads the threads of energy in the environment weave through your own threads they weave through you and back out of you and and you're not separate of this dynamic energy tapestry um this dynamic energy weave that goes on at all times within nature. Remember when we talked about the shape of the shape of all shapes you know the shape of all shapes as they move together as one being the, the truth is that you are part of that 
That's yeah. the truth. That's a fundamental truth. It, it, it's a law of nature. You're part of that, and so is everybody else. So part of that is having the discipline to accept that despite your miasma. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, okay, so about Toshal Teen. Last episode, we uh, we chatted a bit about Toshal Teen, the uh, latter half of the episode, and um, I was thinking about this, and... I remember when you were moving from the north of England down to Cornwall, you uh, enlisted my help in basically storing all your crap in one of those, you know, those uh, storage <laughs> facilities. And uh, you were I, a star, sir. <laughs> and um, I remember being a little bit in despair, really, because you were just chucking stuff in. I mean, no order, no system, or anything. And to me, a very systems-based guy, it was, it was crikey, this is insane. Um, but you know, since going over Toshelteen and you're talking to me about that. I kind of remember you had so much fun doing it and you just didn't care. And I remember thinking, this guy's a grown man and he's built a fort. Um, <laughs> yeah, but can you, know, you remember, can you remember just how much stuff we got in that tiny little box? Yeah? I, I remember. Doing it in a seemingly <laughs> random way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah? It was seemingly. unbelievable. I was shocked myself, you know, I was like chucking it in, mussing it around. And actually it was an unbelievable amount of stuff we packed into that small space, you know? Yeah, well, without sure enough, planning, like, without no planning, planning, without planning, without conception. <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, but the point is, at the time, I was like, "What? What the? You know, what the hell is this guy doing?" Um, yeah. But now I'm like, "Well, okay." There's this. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the underlying kind of paradigm shift or sort of feeling or change that happens within when you get when you get to grips with Toshal Teen. Um, to me, the exercises, you know, they're like surface level. Toshal Teen can seep into your outlook um, and influence your actions and attitude in life. Sure. And, uh, so I thought it'd be interesting to get your take on that. Habits, habits are useful, you know, in life. Habits are, are very, very useful. Um, you And some of these habits are so useful that they're actually programmed into us. You know, that like the... Um, People talk about knee-jerk reactions, you know. Mm. If if you put your hand on something very hot, you you will pull that hand away pretty fast, um, and that's built into you. So so, I I would prefix with what I'm about to say, we're saying that I'm not saying that habits aren't useful, but sometimes habits hurt you rather than help you, and these these are that again. It's a bit like it's a bit like two aspects of the word habits. There are habits that are useful, that you develop and they're useful, and then there are habits that you develop because you have taught to think that as you go through your life by various different means. That's the way the world is. And it's not necessarily so. Mm. The So the underlying idea of Toshal Teen is to... And this is the to, second component. Uh, of jealousy, yeah, uh, a second component of jealousy. Yeah. Um, there's no, there's no numbering or order. It's just the intro, the, the order we're introducing them in. Yeah, yeah. So, incidentally, in 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 Mongolia, the the, the traditional hearth inside the ger, ger is what we we in the West call a yurt. Mm. Um, ger is the traditional Mongol uh, felt home, if you like. The the hearth in there is, is always supported by three stones representing the three realms. Um, and the, uh, there's no order to them. There's no, you know, this is number one stone, this is number two stone. No, they just go around in a circle and they put the stuff they want to yeah. cook on top of it. You know, just like the triskel, or the uh, exactly, exactly, yeah. So yeah. Mori. So we develop habits, and sometimes when when we're out being, this is again difference between being an animist and being a shaman. A shaman needs to explore things that an animist doesn't. So sometimes. We will do things, even that it's in in shamanistic activity, in shamanistic technique. We will do things, even when we know that that is is going to have not that great consequences for us. Hopefully, not deadly consequences, but you know, sometimes you know we talked about ago, Sometimes even painful consequences. Um, we will do those things in order to learn, in order to receive feedback from the from the natural natural world. Mm. And, and this is where this is where shamanism gets a little darker than perhaps people are used to, or perhaps people realize. Yes, but you've you've got to remember that that that, that the shaman was not it, 
that we talk about shamanistic societies or shamanistic communities. The shaman wasn't everybody. The shaman was one guy or maybe one guy and his apprentice out of the group. Mm. He chose that life. Generally, he chose that life. We said anybody has the potential to become a shaman, but even in animus communities, few people actually want to do it. It's, it's, it has, it has things that the average person find uncomfortable. Remember we were talking about part of Toshal teen. When, whenever you catch yourself saying, I'm not the kind of person who, I don't know, likes dancing. Hey, there's a one for me. Yeah. You know, mm. I, these days I'm, I'm crazy about dance, about spirit dance, you know, absolutely crazy mm. about it. If you got me when I was 17 and asked me to do some dancing, I would have been, you know, um, horrified, <laughs> absolutely yeah. horrified, you know. I've got a very so, similar story as well. Yeah, I mean, it's putting, yes. the, it's putting ourselves at, outside the comfort zone, isn't it? And that's always a good thing in life. If you want to push yourself forward, it's always good to. Yeah, but it's not, it's not, I, 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 that is true. Okay. But I don't want to build this. This is not personal development. Yeah. In shamanism, we put ourselves out of, outside of our quote unquote comfort zone for a purpose. That purpose is to gain feedback from nature, to gain true understanding. Rather than you know, the opposite, the exoteric thing we could do is we could st- sit around and start believing things, you know. Yeah. Um, we, in, in shamanism, we don't want to sit around believing things. We want to go out and get the, the again, the English word, the truth. Wonderful word there. Uh, <laughs> we could do several podcasts on <laughs> breaking down that word, you know. But but what I mean by the truth is uh, if If I get feedback from nature, if I do something and I get feedback, direct feedback from nature that isn't colored by anything that some person has ever come up with or invented or anything of that nature, Mm. then I can have a high degree of confidence that that feedback is quite useful information. And that's, that's really the underlying essence of Toshal Teen. That's, that's what Toshal Teen itself is. The activity of Toshal Teen. Yeah. The thing that we're trying to build is Chelicity. Toshal teen, bat, uh, guchuch, these are things that we can focus on in order to build chelicity. But chelicity is not an activity. Chelicity, as we've said, is a state of being. So mm. again, we're talking about something that shamans do, not even that animists do, just something that shamans do. In order to, to move towards that state of chelicity, they apply techniques. You can think of these techniques as falling into three categories in the base layer of the of the shamanistic pagoda the the three categories or three of the categories being toshalti and guchuk and bat cool well that leads us uh that leads us nicely on to the next one could you give um some more do you remember in episode one uh you briefly talked about uh the chelicity and we briefly talked about the three components of chelicity sure. and for guchuk you mentioned um a, a really good uh, it kind of stuck with me a, a fine wine analogy like a, yeah like a fine wine that ages over time so do you want to just expand on that what what did you mean in terms of guchach okay so uh, if you remember i think i said guchach is a tricky one um mm. what i mean is that the, the reason it's a tricky one is um Bat and Toshal Teen are things you can walk straight out the door and start working on, or stay, stay inside the door and start working on. Yeah. Guchuch is something that you can, you can work on, you can start working on immediately, but working on it, it doesn't, it, it builds so slowly. Uh, um, you know, we talked about, um, different shamanistic exercises, different shamanistic techniques, people may wonder why on earth would you do that? Mm. Um, very often, the answer to that question is um, the, the At the time you're doing them, they seem to have very little effect or very, very little, uh, you're making very, very little progress. But it builds, you know, it, it builds. If, if you imagine... It seeps into your bones slowly. Yeah, a, a very slow growth, you know, a bit like, I guess, play tectonics. You know, the continents, they move around, but they move around so slowly that nobody kind of notices. But, you know, give a few million years and, hey, presto, you know, Europe is separate from, from America, for instance, you know. Mm. Um, although nobody would perceive that movement, you know. So... So the wine analogy, uh, that's a, 
That's an interesting one. So let me, I, if you remember, I specifically said Burgundy. I didn't say any old wine, and there's kind of a reason for that. Um, when, when I mean, I've never made Burgundy, but, but you know, Burgundy's famous kind of wine and, and how it's made has kind of become famous because of that. Um, the interesting thing is when, when they make Burgundy, you know, everybody knows it's a red wine. It's a red, red, red wine with a lot of character. When they make it, when they first make it, it's completely clear. Or when they start to make it, that the juice that comes out of the grapes is is clear. And it needs ongoing contact with the skins and the pips um, to bring out that red color, uh, the, the, the to bring that red color out in the wine, it needs that, and that takes quite a bit of effort. Um, so, if you if you imagine your apprentice, uh, your apprentice, you're a good apprentice, a shamanistic apprentice. You've got a, you've got great chillicity, you know that you know. So the uh, your guide is not going to have much trouble with you because your chillicity is great, you know. You're like that clear wine. Um, but the there is more to shamanism than that, and although that's a great foundation. Your juice is clear, yeah. Your your like clear water, you know. Um, but the your guide knows that you don't want to be an animist, yeah. You're already an animist if your juice is clear, right? Mm -hmm. He knows that you want to be a shaman, and therefore you have to start doing things in order to draw character from the outside into you i if you think of yourself as the juice and the skins and the pips are are that that foundation within nature that you're going to need to do your job as a shaman the shaman has something to do that the, the guide has something to do here or if you don't have a guide you have something to do here so the fermentation of the wine begins. Um, it can be, it can start completely naturally. That would like be somebody who was, had a really good outlook and, and kind of started working on Chalisti, um, managed to free themselves quite a lot from their miasma through the, under their own steam. And, and that's kind of like, that's the process of fermentation. Um, but it can sometimes, the fermentation is sometimes triggered by adding yeast into the wine. Um, and that's like somebody starts to teach you some, some shamanic techniques. Um, they, they, um, they start to, from outside of you, they start to point you to things within nature that you didn't that you didn't take on in your normal state. So if you think about what the guide's doing in that case, you know, the shaman and his apprentice, each day when they make a when they're making burgundy, there's a kind of labor intensive process. What's happened is that the skins and the pips have kind of floated onto the wine and they've made like a cap, like a layer on top of the wine. And the, they have to go and break up that, that cap, break up the cap of, of pips and, and skins and push it down into the juice over and over again each day. Um, and that, that settling out of the cap of skins and pips is like what we talked about. It's like the, the, the apprentice succumbing to distraction, the apprentice allowing his miasma to, to cut to form a cutting between himself and nature. So shamanistic technique, as you probably, you know, if you've been, if you've been listening all the way through the podcast we've done, you've, you've probably got yourself come to this sort of understanding that shamanism, shamanistic technique is, is very like breaking up that cap of pips and skin. It's, it's very like, especially when you have a guide, you know, when we talked about, I'll find a way to cross the stream. And my guide said, no, find all the ways to cross the stream. That's like him stamping on or breaking up that cap of pips and skins and forcing it down into my juice. Um, and that develops, that starts to develop the color of the wine, um, the real color of the wine. 
rather than a kind of imagined facility. You know, mm. you know, I'm talking wine. I'm using the wine analogy. Yeah, as an let analogy. me just be clear then. So the pips and the skins form a form like almost like an analogous barrier between you and, um, well, I mean, loosely you and nature. Um, or, and and every time that's broken up, it's like you gain that little bit of experience. Exactly, and that's like you taking on color, like the wine. Yeah? Yes, it's continual reinforcement and feedback. The continual reinforcement is coming from your guide if you're a Shams apprentice, you know, or should be, uh, or if you don't, ha- if you don't, ha- if you're not an apprentice, that has to come from within you. That that's a you know the hard way, but it, it, it's possible. Yeah. Mm. If, but the feedback isn't coming from the guide. Shamanism, shamanism as you know yourself, a, a, a guide, a shamanistic teacher, generally they don't tell you what the feedback is. They'd, I don't come along and say, oh, that's good, Chilisti, you're doing there, Joe. Keep doing better, Chilisti. You know, it's not like that. It's, it's a, I'm setting side, signposts. But the feedback you are getting is coming not from the guide, but from nature itself. Breaking up the ca- cap of pips and skins yeah. is like making sure that you keep on that. You keep on that. And that change happens within rather than uh, almost in an exoteric way. I mean, if a guide came along and said, um, you know, very definitively, yes, that's correct. No, that's not. Then, then um, an apprentice might go away and get the wrong idea. Exactly. Exactly. And it is rude, you know, shamanistic. It, it's not, you know, I'd, again, this English language again, the word teaching, you know, it, it's not teaching, it's guiding. Yeah. Mm. Um, then, okay, so next next part of the, the, the uh, staying on the subject of wine, since we're on it, when the fermentation of a burgundy is completed, uh, the wine gets kind of pressed and they, they put it in a barrels, um, they don't put it straight in the bottle. They put it in the barrels for aging. Um, and this is this is also what we talked about. Is this is where the guide sort of gives away, and you have to put in your your the work yourself. In in this is you taking on the fact that it's no longer Damon showing me how to be a shaman. This is me accepting responsibility for becoming a shaman. This is me taking that responsibility on myself. And this is where you you put in the legwork. This is where you start practicing your shamanistic techniques, varying them, you know, experimenting, uh, uh, learning more. Um, and, of course, this works at all the different levels in the pagoda, all seven levels, if you want to call it seven levels. Mm. So in the winemaking process, what actually happens is that the, the wine, in, in as it's aging, in, this is just Burgundy we're talking about. It may, may happen with other wines. I don't know. It goes a kind of second fermentation, but this is a different a different type of fermentation. In biological terms, it's called a malolactic fermentation. Um, during that time, the, the some of the the malic acid in the wine turns into lactic acid, and and basically what that does is over a long period of time, it gradually makes the wine smoother. And richer, and so what we're talking about now is the, you know, the apprentice is no longer an apprentice. The the apprentice has has moved into the state where he now has ownership. And interestingly, you know, we talked about one of the places where uh, shamanism hid in plain sight mm. uh, was to go into secret societies. And I guess you would say the most famous of all secret societies all over the world is, is Freemasonry. Yeah. Um, and in Freemasonry, they, they have this, um, concept of what they call the three original degrees. Um, and, and I, I'm not a Freemason. Um, I've, I've studied it. Uh, I've studied about Freemasonry. Um, but, but my understanding is these, the first two of those three degrees represent a much older process uh, that was based on the idea of people, the, the building, the, the, the masons who built the great cathedrals of Europe. Um, and this this is exactly what I'm talking about. The first level, the first one is the entered apprentice. That's the person who's learning how to, you know, measure out a block of stone, cut it out. He's learning the tools of the trade. But then... Over a period of time, he gets comfortable with those tools. At that point, 
if he's a mason, we're talking about a real mason now, back in the Middle Ages, building a cathedral. No, nobody's going to let him anywhere near a cathedral. The cathedrals, they, they were, they were serious Christians. Those those guys, they were not going to let anybody who's a, an apprentice get anywhere near building a cathedral. But they're learning the tricks of the trade. They're observing the other people around them who have better skills than them, better techniques, and they're taking it on. And then sooner or later, they feel confident of their technique that they're willing to take on the responsibility of what in Freemasonry they call the, the fellow craft, like the second level. And that is somebody whose skills are good enough to start contributing. He's probably not leading the whole cathedral building project, but he's, his skills are good enough that he can start to actually do some useful work. Kind of reminds me of the a- Japanese sushi chef. <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly yes yeah. um and then then over many many years he works on cathedrals he gains more and more knowledge and more and more understanding this is a shaman practicing his techniques over more and more years the lactic acid in his metaphorical wine is 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 appearing and the malic acid is is disappearing and that the his wine is taking on a richness a wide broad experience a rich flavor a rich character and eventually he becomes a master and this that would be in the cathedral building um he would then be the kind of guy who they would allow to do the really difficult bits yeah Mm. um and um and this this idea has been preserved in freemasonry though i suspect in a very exoteric way these days um but it's been handed down and it, it parallels quite nicely that the the way that uh an apprentice goes on to become a shaman um interestingly another secret society that we refer to um mithraism same kind of idea um this is the the secret society within the roman empire that preserved a lot of shamanistic um type of technique um the there were three levels three the first three levels of mithraism um so now we're talking 2000 years ago rather than you know the here and now mm. the first level was called corax um the crow um very very interestingly the symbol of corax was the cup or the chalice um isn't that interesting you know um and then so that would be like the entered apprentice his cup is empty his, you know, it would be like the, the novice shaman starting his apprenticeship with the old experienced shaman. His mm. cup's empty, hopefully, that he's got chillisty, because if it's full, the shaman ain't going to be able to help him very much. The, the cup is empty, but he, he hasn't got any technique. Uh, so he starts to learn shamanistic technique. It probably doesn't make a lot of sense to him to begin with but over time he takes on more and more technique and through learning all of these different techniques and practicing them and getting feedback from nature he starts to see some sign of consistency he starts to see that that there was there is something there underlying all of that that isn't as disparate as he thought it was to begin with if you like the veil of of his social conditioning the veil of his miasma starts to be lifted and he he starts to see that there's a lot more to this. And again, he starts to take ownership of what it is he's doing. He starts to see that he is, I guess, in Mithraism, he is a, a Mithraist. He, he is, that's what he does. He's an esotericist. Mm. Interestingly, the, the symbol in, in Mithraism, one of the symbols of the second level was the veil. Yeah, the veil, i.e. the veil is being lifted. Uh, the veil of the, being the miasma. And then... The, the third level, the miles, uh, the soldier, that's him putting in his legwork. That's him being a fellow craft. If you want to t- talk about the cathedral building in Europe, metaphorically speaking, that's him going around Europe, working on lots of different cathedral projects, refining his skills over many, many years. And in Mithraism, he then emerges out of that process as Leo, as the li- as a lion, a great kind of shining light of the, the tradition. Now, what, what I'm talking about here is two different examples of shamanistic ideas that have been preserved in two different secret societies, uh, 2000 years apart, um, that both hark back to this general idea of how somebody becomes a shaman, the early stages of how somebody becomes a shaman. I think, um, for me personally, anyway, and, I, and I, I do believe, like, if I find it interesting, our audience would as well. I think, think 
uh, Mithraism and uh, the stonemasonry is something we could explore in future podcasts again. Really, I'm sure there's a lot of knowledge hidden away in those. Um, uh, Mithraism, Mithraism is is uh, a really interesting subject, really, really interesting subject because it, it is very little known. Very few people have actually even heard of it. Mm. And yet it had an enormous impact on all of our lives. It's one of the most influential things in the subsequent develop of, development of Europe. I'm going to show my ignorance here, but I mean, I, I seem to remember something reading somewhere, something about Mithraism and, and Jesus Christ, actually, in Christmas or something like that. Um, oh, not the old, the old, uh, what's, what's Mithras's birthday joke? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, anyway. Mithras's birthday was the 25th of December. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so, um, that, so that's, but that's, that, that's, that is actually true, but it, it's, it's nothing to do with what I'm referring to. But, but yeah, yeah, all I was saying is that Mithraism and Christianity definitely cross pollinated each other. That's for sure. Okay, so and of course they were, they were both developing at the same time, right? They were both developing within the the early the Roman Empire. Yeah, they were they were developing with, at the same time within the Roman Empire, and in many cases, exactly the same people. You know, uh, a Christian in in at that time in Rome, you know, two thousand years ago, mm-hmm. uh, a Christian could also be a member of the Mithraic Secret Society. So it's, it could actually be literally the same people. <laughs> I love stuff like this. I really do. <laughs> it's like it's like the mystery, isn't it? Uncovering the little the little mysteries of, of 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 why we're here. Well, there's two it's there's fantastic. two kind of there's two kind of mysteries. Um, one of my teachers, uh, who you know, um, once said to me, "A lot of this stuff is self secret. Mm. Um, it's um, it's self secret, and that it's not a mystery. You could find this information if you're interested in in it, but most people aren't." Yeah, good point. Yeah. Um, okay. So this is, um, you might have answered this already, uh, but just to clarify and put into simplistic terms, um, Guchach is something that naturally develops over time, right? So you could say, uh, I've used the pianist example, but if you spent years and years becoming a concert pianist, uh, at the end of the, at the end of all that, you were going to have a tr- tremendous amount of Guchach in that very narrow specific field. Um, yeah. Even a sure. something like a, a would you say you know like you know like um in a basketball game or something uh, speaking hypothetically and you you're in the zone and and you all of a sudden the basket goes the ball goes in the basket and you don't quite know how it did is that much almost of its own accord yeah yeah it, it just happens without thinking yeah is that chillist that well, is that chillisty or is that gucha I know it's a stupid question well uh, if you're uh... If you were playing basketball at the highest level and you managed to achieve that, then definitely that's going to be good. Yeah. If you're if you're playing basketball against a, a pretty rubbish team, um, then then it may be luck. <laughs> yeah. I think I answered my own question. I think it's more to do with the uh, eyes of the eagle. The Borot had something, something, something had a che. <laughs> uh, uh, how, why don't we do a podcast on the Mongol language? Sometime, <laughs> yeah, we should do. <laughs> Um, okay so that's a fantastic um a fantastic uh introduction to to what guchach is so do you want to talk about guchach and your i don't know quote-unquote speciality guchach and the spirit dance the animal spirit ah, dance. i'd love to talk about that yeah. yeah so i guess the first thing to say is that you know we're talking about fertility being the first stage and of of, of shamanism and that you you need, need chillisty to to support the later stages, but you know if if we were to wait for your guchach to be good enough, <laughs> then nobody would ever get anywhere. So so what I would say is all of the stages of shamanism uh, they build your guchach, yeah. So don't start worrying about the fact that your guchach's not not up to scratch. Yeah. You know, um, the best thing when you're really just starting out is is to focus on bat and toshal teen. Yeah. Um, and and guchach trust that it will come. Trust yeah. that it will come. It like it, it's like there in the background, isn't it? Just just slowly getting more coins in it. More the more more coins in the piggy bank of guchach. Slowly yeah. but surely. But I'm I'm very pleased for your question, Joe, because I feel like I've been I've been uh, good as gold holding off talking about spirit dance on these these podcasts so far. So, well. <laughs> so, so first first thing to say that 
Um, just just to draw a distinction, spirit dance and animal spirit dance are uh, um, they're definitely the same thing, but they're not at an equal level. Um, animal spirit dance is a more advanced form of spirit dance than just spirit dance. Lots and lots of traditions have <clears throat> types of spirit dance. We talked about the whirling dervishes and yeah. and various other things. There's loads in Sufism. Yes. Tremendous so, amount. So here, um, I'm not talking about animal spirit dance. I'm just talking about spirit dance. Um, you cannot proceed um, to animal spirit dance unless you can do spirit dance without thinking. And of course, you know, they talk about the three levels. You you have to you have to take on the technique. You have to take on the mechanics of the technique. Um and so again this is this is solicity. And and spirit dance is much easier to do than animal spirit dance. It's way easier. You know, if if you think of a difference in a difference in difficulty level, it's like spirit dance is like beginner and, and mm. animal spirit dance is like advanced. You can, in spirit dance, take on a guchach quite quickly, and one of the things one of the things that shamans do, um, in order to make that process even easier, is they keep their spirit dance very very simple. Yep, um, the fewer patterns that you use in your spirit dance, the fewer movements, if you like. Um, the easier it is to get your spirit dance to the point where you don't have to think about it. Of course, there's a trade-off. Um, the trade-off being that if your spirit dance is not rich enough, you limit yourself in some ways in terms of, remember that the, the purpose of your spirit dance is to create a weave that interacts in rich ways with nature the simpler your spirit dance is the less rich your weave you're creating is the less ways it can interact with with nature but it can still interact with nature so uh, as you know my my own spirit dance is, is probably rather at the other extreme um and because you know it's my favorite shamanistic it, technique well so you've you worked expect- on it haven't you you've worked on it for years and years and years exactly I, and i love it and and but you know if you if you find a shaman who works on some other type of shamanistic technique, um, then, you know, maybe there's a shaman out there who's who's an expert in what I would call earth breathing, and he's worked on that for years and years. You will find that the way he does his earth breathing is much more sophisticated than the way I do my earth breathing. So do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. But the, the, the issue, which we'll probably talk about in more depth when we come on to to spirit dance the downs the big downside if you want to if you if you're happy just to ship spirit dance as a shamanistic technique it's great technique by itself without the animal spirits if you're happy just to do that then then cool yeah if if you want to proceed to take on one of my animal spirits then the simpler your spirit dance is you start the the, the more you limit the complexity of your spirit dance, the more you limit the possible range of animals that you're going to be able to take on. And some shamans actually do this. They they take only one, only one animal, and they learn the spirit dance that's conducive to taking on that animal. Um, There's 12 in, in Shingy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Shingy is rather at the other extreme as well, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, no. uh, 12, as, as you know, Joe, as you know, Joe, 12 is a crazy large number if you want to get good at them, yeah? Oh, okay. um, Speaking controversially, but, but you know, if, if anybody's interested in Shingy, the depth for each animal it is far too much for one lifetime, you know, if you really have yeah, the depth and, and there's, in the there's historical Yeah, and there's historical reasons for that. Shingy was, a, Shingy was an art that came from professional soldiers, and they had nothing to do, basically, all day long, mm-hmm. unless they were fighting a war. They had nothing to do all day long but practice their, their Shingy, you know, so... Um, you know, people like Saudi were they were professional soldiers. So, um, uh, so that's one of the reasons for that. They had plenty of time on their hands. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, but the the key point and the importance of guchach in spirit dance, not animal spirit dance, just spirit dances, that when you become familiar enough with the amskar, the 
the breathing and you remember how the breathing links on the, on the one side, how it links in the tanger, um, and the satel, the spirit. And on the other side, how it links into your movement. When you, uh, gain that as a, as a understanding and you know what we mean by understanding by now, understanding the baseline, midline, top line, all acting together all as one. Acting together as one. Yeah. <laughs> People are going to get really sick of hearing that, aren't they? Um, the, well, you know, we've got to hammer it home. We've got to hammer it home. All yes, it is that, that just to be honest, the reason why I keep repeating that is it's it's such a prevalent practice within our society to think that baseline analysis equals understanding. And that's the only reason why I keep repeating it. Yeah. And incidentally, the, you're talking about the breath. Uh, we obviously haven't come on to that in detail yet. And obviously it's yeah. very hard to try and piece all this knowledge together in some sort of order. But sure, we sure. are going to come but on all, to it eventually. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But all I'm saying, all I'm saying is that. When you, you start to take yourself out of the picture in your spirit dance, people can imagine the spirit dance has something to do with movement, if nothing else. Yeah. When you take yourself out that movement, and that movement isn't being generated by you, it's being generated by, by Tengar, by your, the, the underlying spirit, the Setel. When you can take yourself out that picture, then you can start to do more advanced things like animal spirit dance. But putting yourself into the place where you can start to do that. Again, we're talking about ways of empirically showing to yourself that you are progressing with your shamanism. When you can get there and you can actually start to do that, you know you've taken on a guchuch because the guchuch is that facility that you've developed to do your spirit dance without thinking about it, just spontaneously. um, It's just being generated. It's almost like you're not dancing that dance. Nature is dancing that dance for you. And, And you're completely... You're, you're completely, you, your baseline is completely out of the picture. That is, ex, that is guchuch. That is, you have taken on guchuch in your spirit dance. So this is why I said spirit dance is a lot easier than animal spirit dance because taking on a guchuch for spirit dance, you can do relatively quickly, you know, a few years, a couple of years, something like that. Mm. Um, taking on a guchuch for animal spirit dance even for one animal spirit is is an, an altogether tougher is an altogether tougher thing but you can't even attempt that unless you've got guchuk so what i'm saying is you can see as you go through the layers through the rooms as you go higher and higher up the pagoda you can see that your guchuk is building all the way and you will get evidence that it is because you will come to the point where you cannot even a, what i mean is you you will go from a place where you start learning spirit dance and you are physically unable if you try to do animal spirit dance. And then you'll go to a point where you can do animal spirit dance and therefore your guchach with respect to your spirit dance, you know it's there because if it wasn't, you wouldn't even be, be attempting this thing or if you attempted it, you would fail. Mm. Yeah, so that's that's um, kind of how... Um, that's if If you invest heavily... In your spirit dance, you can um, you you can um, uh, avoid uh, the over application of something that that's that's back on Mongol. Sorry, Joe. Another word, tairach. Mm. Um, tairach is a it's it's a term that re- refers to a fragmented weave. You know that we talk about this weave of energy, woven energy within Europe. Mm. Tairach is something that fragments the weave. If people who do spirit dance but don't do it very much, you tend to see quite an excessive application of Tairach. It's not necessarily desirable, and they're not doing it deliberately. Um, and and this you can see this often in, in uh, uh, if you see shamans doing their spirit dance. Sometimes you'll see them using what I call a hick step. Um, it's um, it's a it's a cutting in the floor of the movement. Uh, it works really nicely with the rhythm, and I do it. I do it myself sometimes, deliberately, not accidentally. Um, mm-hmm. It helps, you know. It's like a reinforcement of the rhythm. But the problem is, it tends to cut the weave. This the tairach is not necessarily desirable all the time. So, if you're doing tairach on every step, as you see some simplistic forms of spirit dance, to me that's not that helpful. I, I would be using tairach in spirit dance. I would be using that in balance with other 
traits. You know, we we talked about you know the, the spirals, of water going down a plug hole, mm. the the spiral shapes of the galaxies. There are a, a range of changes, energy changes that you can use in your spirit dance. We're not we're not talking about animal spirit dance, just in your spirit dance that are beneficial to if you think of your weave as creating a radar for nature. They create the, you know, maybe your radar, if you, you get good at a lot of these things, your radar becomes like one of these sophisticated radars that puts out multiple frequencies and, and you know, does clever stuff. Um, uh, skills like Tolka, Nektech, Totolun, other ones like Shulug, uh, Egeldech, um, uh, th- these... <laughs> These are all words that are going to hopefully one day become familiar to you, Joe. Yeah. Um, th- these are all rich, different skills that you can use, different, different, and they're not skills, they're energy changes that you can use in your, your spirit dance. Tyrach is one of them. But what I would say is a pitfall with spirit dance is that the excessive use of Tyrach, because it fits nicely with the rhythm, um, isn't, isn't that helpful? It, it, it can be used, but it, to me, it should be used in balance. Maybe I'm jumping ahead of ourselves a bit, but what I am saying is that if you want real guchuch in your spirit dance, you would be investing in, in learning, understanding all of these changes. If you're really serious about your spirit dance and that in itself would build your guchuch, it would be like the red wine gaining that, the second fermentation, gaining that character. Whereas, if you just go, you know, Tyrach, Tyrach, Tyrach in, in, in line with the rhythm, then sure, you might do some decent spirit dance. You might have a nice tasty wine, but it ain't this fine burgundy that's been laid down for years. It's just a tasty wine. What are the um, downsides to that? What, 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 what could you, could you conceptualize the differences between somebody doing a, a fine, a, a fine burgundy kind of spirit? animal spirit dance compared to somebody doing a very well, basic was, spirit let's, dance. Let's be, let's be clear. I was talking about spirit dance, not animal spirit dance. Mm. If you're doing a fine burgundy on animal spirit dance, you don't need to be listening to this podcast. <laughs> um, <laughs> you really don't. <laughs> uh, I, I, no, I, I have, <laughs> um, I have met in my life a couple of people yeah. uh, who could do that. And, and they, won't, they probably won't be very interested in this podcast. Yeah. They might be amused that I've done it, um, <laughs> but they won't, uh, or that we've done it. Uh, I don't think they'll be listening too carefully. Uh, having ha- having a, a high level of guchuk in animal spirit dance, that's something that I aspire to. If I, if I could get there before I die, that'd be fantastic. Okay. Um, that is that is incredibly difficult okay. thing to achieve. Real uh, high level. Even for a single... Even for a single animal, let alone the twelve that are in Shingi, you know. Yeah. Um, so, um, you can think of of spirit dance as a, uh, a a continuum from simple to to uh, rich mm. um, from a from a tasty sort of red wine that you you buy, you know, just out of a shop, not that old, to a to a grand and noble burgundy, but in in spirit dance, let's forget animal spirit dance. Everybody can aspire if they're interested in spirit dance. Everybody can aspire to to develop the rich cooker simply by simply by making sure that you're covering the energy changes. And and we said we were going to do a podcast on the I Ching at some point in time. Mm-hmm. We can we can talk about all of the energy changes um, using Chinese, Mongol, Japanese, or whatever you want, Joe, on that yeah. <laughs> podcast. Um, yeah. And and then people will get a better idea. But the, the whole point is. If you're serious about your spirit dance, you you want to be embodying all of those energy changes and and linking into all of those energy changes within the environment, um, because yeah. that will build a much richer guchuk, like the noble burgundy. When you're talking about uh, what was it, TK? What were you saying when you cut in it? When you cut in the floor, what was that Mongol word? Tairach. 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 So, Tairach. Uh, would 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 an example of Tairach be, let's say? Um, Okay, just to put this into context, I believe this is what if if, if any of our audience have have any experience in 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 real in the real shamanic technique on some level, this might be sound familiar. But when you're just stood and you are literally just, I think I talked about this on the first episode, but just going left, right, left, right, you know <laughs> yes. that kind of yes. that and that does that does put you in a trance. It really does put you in a trance. Yes. Um, but that 
you know, and you see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. That's Tyrak. Yeah. That's Tyrak. Okay, yeah. cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, okay. That's pretty good. Is that, I mean, you know, when you talked about bat, um, you had certain words which gave a flavor of bat, um, paragality being one discipline, steadfastness, etc. Have you got any for, for Guha, which could give a, I have one. one yet. I, I'm extremely reluctant to use it. You're talking about English words, aren't you? I'm extremely reluctant to use it for the same reason that I'm reluctant to use a lot of other words. Remember, we, yeah. we talked about uh, well, the words, why I don't like the word meditation. Well, we, we, we but, talked about the word spirit in an entire podcast episode. So I, yeah, I get the, what you mean. The, the word is grace. Uh-huh. Um, that's, that's, but again, you know, the, the level of cultural baggage in our society attached to that word. Yeah. But somebody who exhibits guchuch, to me, and my my meaning of the word grace, uh, do you remember we talked about Jen Tovel and Christopher Dean, mm. uh, the Blair of Sarajevo Olympics, you know? Mm. Incredible level of grace, incredible. Um, it's, but grace can, you know, it's, it's not just that physical grace. We say that person's very graceful and move very gracefully. It's a grace that, that that would be grace in the midline, right? We said a lot of people who get gukha, they get it to what in, in our society, they get it because they excel in a physical discipline. That's the midline, right? Yeah. To me, real gukha isn't just grace in the midline. It's grace at the baseline, grace in the midline, but especially grace in the top line, in, in the, in the branches mm. and leaves. Um, in Tengar, in, in terms of Tengar in the creative realm. And, and in shamanism, it's that kind of grace mm. that you're looking for more than anything else. Because, you know, remember Fan Quan's painting, that's how we're trying to rebalance ourselves so that we can get true. The nature can be a true teacher for us. You know, I said you can't teach shamanism. Well, there is one thing in the world that can teach shamanism, and that is nature. Yeah. Alton Dehil. Okay, brilliant. I think um, you were talking about the I Ching and the energy changes. I think if if uh, I think a lot of our audience will, will have some sort of interest in the martial arts. Uh, if you don't, there's, there's plenty to obviously understand and get out of those. But that'll be particularly interesting uh, when we when we start talking about yeah, the I'm, I Ching. I'm sure that I'm sure that if if anybody's got to a, a fairly advanced level in a martial arts, especially a martial art where you know you actually test yourself, yeah. um, you know, then in some way, then then they will, I'm sure, just, you know, we, we may not be explaining this in the best way, but I'm sure that those people will be picking up on what we're trying to convey here. Yeah, it's going to be particularly interesting um, talking about the physical likewise, natures. <laughs> likewise, if there are any seriously good musicians listening, it will be the same kind of thing because they will have experience of Guchuch at some sort of level, you know? Yeah, cool. Um, All right. Is there a good way to differentiate between chillicity as a whole and guhach? Um, I'm just throwing really, that out there, that question. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't really, <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't really work like that. The, yeah. These are things that we focus on as part of, you know, there's two things, right? There's shamanism, mm. and then there's the process through which we go through to become a shaman. Yeah. Um, the process, these things are to do with the process they are not the thing itself. No shamanistic technique is the thing itself. They are things that point us towards the thing itself. The thing itself, we can't just take it on. We might want to. We might want to take it on. You know, I I'd often thought, wouldn't it be nice if there was a bottle of guchach knocking around somewhere? <laughs> and all I had to do was drink it and I'd be away, you know? Uh, but unfortunately not. So so I would distinguish between the process of becoming a shaman, remember the seven stages, and shamanism itself. The two things are not the same. Yeah. The process of becoming a shaman is, is it, the processes, they're, they're all sim, they have similarities, but they, they have different stages. They have different, but you know, there's lots of techniques in shamanism in the world. I hate to think how many shamanistic techniques are in the world. Millions probably, you know, yeah. um, they, they point towards something. They point towards something and what they point towards is tenger. It's it's the underlying spirit of nature. Well, Tenga, Dehil, and Tam, the underlying spirits of nature. Uh, in in Mongol, the, collectively, this is sometimes known as Burhan. This word Burhan, um, 
they point towards Bohan, which is a very, very fundamental level of nature. Mm. Um, the, um, but Chal- Chalisti, you know, uh, Paragalti, Newton, and Grace, if you want me to give you three English words, um, those things are part of the technique. They're things that the places that we focus things. They're part of if you think ourselves as going through a tube or like a production line, you know, mm. we're going down the production line and various things we're focusing on, you know, somewhere we're getting ribbits put in, some guy, somebody's inserting a microchip, you know, the stuff that we're focusing on, different things are happening at different points in the process, but they are not what comes out the other end of the tube. What comes out the other end of the tube or the production line is a shaman. They themselves are not shamanism. They are simply techniques or focuses or points of focus or guideposts that point us and keep us flowing down that that path. You know, yeah. talked about the Hommichi, the, the natural path. That's that's what they are. So so there is no way to distinguish. As you know, they're all three parts of one whole. And mm. all it is is it's it's a way of getting started. Down the line, you know, maybe we work on this for a while and you we're we're up there in the pagoda and you will look back and you'll on one level you'll be thinking why did we even bother talking about them there? So obviously just the same thing that it, it, it seems completely pointless from that point looking back, um, to separate them or distinguish them. But what I would say is the, the, the thing to remind yourself when you are at that stage of the process is that you went through that process yourself. And I guarantee you, if you hadn't had that type of a distinction, you hadn't had those sort of techniques or some equivalent of them that you're applying, you would never have got to this place where you've got to, from which you're looking back saying that, why did we bother distinguishing them? (laughs) Yeah, okay. Well, I've got to say, Damon, this has been an absolutely fascinating episode for me. I mean, I remember when you first told me about these three levels as uh, the levels, these three components of Chilistia as as, um, as Paragal and Neotony and Grace, uh, I thought I understood them. Now I understand. I do not understand. <laughs> so uh, there is so much more to it than I than I understood. So look, you you remember your understanding on the baseline yeah. <laughs> of Chalisti will never come. So don't hope for it. Chalisti is not of the baseline. It's partly of the baseline. It's mostly of the midline and top line, given that we're baseline obsessed. You know, we're good at the baseline. Yeah. Mm. We're really, really good at it. As a, as a settled civilized species, we're really good at the baseline. It's the other two lines where we need some help. And what I feel you're struggling with just when you said that, what I felt you're struggling with when you said that is, I wonder when my baseline understanding of Chalisti <laughs> is ever going to come. No, it's not. <laughs> Take it from me, mate. And, you know, if you need that, then, you know, maybe pick something other than Shamanist. Hey, computer programming is probably good, oh, you know, no. a good discipline to take up. <laughs> no, thank you very much. <laughs> Nothing does my head in more. Um, right. Thank you ever so much. I think I think this is going to be a, a nice point to just uh, hint at what's to come. We've mentioned the seven stages of shamanism a few times now, just to kind of put them into a definitive order um, uh, as, as, as a bit of an advert of what's to come. You know, you, you won't understand these just yet, but obviously we've talked about number one. That's the chalice, chalicity. And we've talked about, briefly we've talked about stage two, but we are going to talk about it a bit more, and that's called the breath. Um, stage three, we've got the dance, uh, which is the spirit dance. Um, in, 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 oh. Yeah, and as as you know now, we we have we now have stage three, part A and B, don't we? Uh, yeah. We've let you into that little secret: <laughs> the spirit dance and then the animal spirit dance. Yeah, yeah. and then we've got stage four, the weave, um, right. and then we've got stage five, which is the vessel, creating the vessel, which which I remember you saying is is the is the interplay between the weave and the dance. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you we'll hopefully we'll have laid enough foundation at that point yeah. so that these things are making a bit more sense by the time we get there. Yeah. But this is, it's, it's not the vessel. There's no, there's no vessel. In some ways, the vessel is your chalicity, you know? Yeah. This is this is another of these words you can't translate into English. It's called modoch. Well, as soon as you... So s- let's just call it that. Modoch. Let's just call it modoch. As soon as you say vessel, <laughs> as soon as you say it, you imagine 
a canoe. You imagine a stallion. You I imagine know, something. I know. So it's, it's not. Oh, the Chilean. The Chilean. The Chilean you know, yeah. other Chinese unicorn, yeah. And then stage six, we've got the journey, um, which is uh, which is which is fascinating in itself. And then the stage seven, we've got the monad. Is that how you pronounce it? Monad. Yeah. Well, monad's an English, actually an English word, mate. The um, it's, it's the nechtel. The nechtel, the nechtel yeah. the Mongol. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, sometime we'll do, I'll tell you. When we get, when we, whenever we do get on to do a, a podcast about the nechtel, um, <laughs> I think we'll be having part one, part two, part three. <laughs> <laughs> well, That'll it's interesting because uh, in a previous episode, you have described <laughs> the nechtel as being the journey. So, you know, obviously, there's obviously these yeah. are the, the the nechtel is not the journey. The nechtel is is in some ways it's intimately connected with the journey, but the, the nechtel is in many ways it's what the journey is about. It's not the journey. Cool. Thank you very much, Damon. That's been a fan, uh, fascinating episode. I've thoroughly enjoyed that one, and I really hope um, all you guys have as well, all you guys listening. Cool, so, man. thank you so much, and I'll see you next week. Cheers, mate.